everything's connecting. We probably are live, but looks like we're we going live. Know. All right. Don't ask us hard questions. Are you live? Are you there yet? <laughs> We're still figuring out Mixer and all its, you know, wonderful. I'm wondering if well, it's, it's getting, if if things are showing up double in the live chat because you and I both have the chat overlay open. No, because it was doing it before I even had it open. Oh, the chat overlay. I don't know. I don't know. All right, here, let's do it. Oh, there we are. What's up, everybody? My name's Indy, and that gentleman way over there on the other side of the room, that's Mr. Jay Powell, and this is Indie Game Business. And today we have Christian back for episode number two. The second half. The second half. Part two, <laughs> like the importance later. and overlooked business parts really? of indie development. With, how do I say your name? Christian Aguilera Perez? I'm uh, so bad. Christian Aguilera. Aguila it's Perez. Eagle in Spanish. <laughs> it's what? Eagle in Spanish. Eagle. Okay. Yeah. Um, from Far Frontier Studios, and he's working on an MMO. MMO. Right, so we'll, we'll do a brief recap. So Christian does a lot of you know talks, especially up around the Vancouver, you know, U.S. Northwest area on understanding the business part of games for indie devs. And he is from originally from Puerto Rico when the hurricane was it Maria or Marie? I can't remember the name of the hurricane. Yeah, Maria. Well, when it was Maria came through and you know, laid waste to Puerto Rico. He packed up and moved all the way across the country to, you know, are you in Oregon? Yeah. Where yeah. are you at in Oregon? Did we talk about that? We talked about Portland. This. That was yeah, like originally you, Portland, uh, and then Beaverton, currently Beaverton right are, now. Are you going to PAX? I'm thinking about it. I actually saw the tickets, and I think most of the good days sold out. So. Yeah, they did. Only like one day left. But... <laughs> I tried last year, and it was the same thing. I should get them a little bit earlier. A little bit earlier, yeah. <laughs> so... Here's a question, and, and and we may have talked about this too, and I, but I can't remember. Why did you pick Oregon when you moved? Funny thing, uh, it was <laughs> mainly influenced by the show Portlandia. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess that works. That works. We, we used to watch the show a lot, and we once we started like scouting what state to move into. Uh, well, we actually did like some research and we found that it was kind of like the best state to live in because it's just a little bit too chill, the, the weather and all that. So, but, but it was mainly influenced by Portlandia. And once we came here, we actually saw that the jokes and like the whole inside stuff of the show. Was Portland actually, you know, is really weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's kind of why we moved over here, but it's, I, I love it. I've been to many states. Recently, New York, uh, Florida, uh, California, all that. And Oregon is just something else, at least on Portland. I agree, my friend. Have you ever been down to Ashland? No. Nope, Ashland is kind of sort of like Portland, but it's really small. Like the downtown is like four blocks and that's it. <laughs> oh, wow. It's a college, hippie, punk rock, earthy, organic, pot growing kind of town is what it is. But yeah, it's really groovy. So I wonder if anyone has ever moved to Philadelphia because they watched It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. I bet you people moved to Boston because of Cheers. Well, yes. Why wouldn't you? Cheers was awesome. But um, that's awesome. I mean, that's good. I'm always curious because we see, we get people, you know, where we live from Florida and, you know, one of the kids in, in my son's class is from Hawaii. And I'm always curious. It's like, when you're in Hawaii, how the hell did you pick this little town to go to? You know, so. Yeah, I had a friend that moved from Hawaii, too. I'm like, why would you move from there? Were you in trouble with the law? <laughs> <laughs> I, had to get, I had to get off the island. Yeah. So uh, what's been going on for the last couple of weeks? Anything exciting on the, on the, on the MMO side, Christian? 
Oh man, <laughs> since we last talked, I've been pretty much, I think I haven't gotten outside of my house. To be honest, I've been stuck on my computer 24 seven. I think I, I, I haven't even played something because I've been rushed with, the, with my day job. We've been like crunching out really hard recently for some play tests. And I'm also preparing the new update for my MMO game. So it's been just constant work nonstop for the past weeks. But it's it's fun. I like it. And I'm learning a lot from that. So is it work with on the MMO or work on you know your full-time job or, or yeah, all both. together? Both. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's always fun when you're crushing. Can, can two you talk projects about your full-time voice. job as well? Yeah, I can give out some details. So we're doing a like a hybrid spaceship shooter slash FPS, kind of like taking Dreadnought and adding FPS elements to it, where you can fly around with the ship, kind of like a like a hero shooter where you uh-huh. pick your ship and you pick your your avatar and you kind of like battle against another team, try to break into their capital ships. So it's like exterior space battles, and then you can launch breach pods and breach into capital ships, and they, then the game turns into an FPS game. So it's very exciting, and we're also doing some cool blockchain stuff, mm-hmm. which I can't talk about that yet. I can talk about the game, but not the whole blockchain stuff. But we're doing a lot of cool things, and the team is composed by a bunch of industry veterans. Uh, there's a lot of high caliber on the team, and... Yeah, we're doing pretty cool, awesome things that I really can't wait to start like showing them. Well, there, there's already a bunch of videos, but like the deep, cool things that we're building out for the game. It's gonna be coming soon. <laughs> right. What I think so, is really cool is on on your day jobs website, um, they have a link right back to your game. So well, that's pretty cool. Yeah, we actually do have a partnership because I was developing my MMO game before I got hired by them. And throughout the, the, like, the time we've been spent working together, we kind of built a partnership with my game where we're going to be leveraging their blockchain platform in the future and kind of like doing the whole metaverse thing and passing assets between games and all that. That's awesome. Okay, for you guys that are listening at home, um, the Christian's website is mankindreborn.com. And the day job is eight circuit studios, but it's the number eight, not the word eight. So if you guys want to check it out. So how do you balance all of that? Yeah, in Shirt Mania, yeah, my head is, is on Christian's green screen behind. I've been trying to actually see if I can pop out behind his shoulder when he's talking, but it hasn't worked yet. That's um, funny. <laughs> so how do you manage and how do you balance the full-time job with the you know, your, your own project, because one, it's very, very cool and very rare that you have a situation where you're working on your own project and your full-time employer actually endorses it and promotes it. And and there's a partnership, but how do you strike that balance? And at the same time, do things like eat and sleep and have somewhat of a social life? Yeah. So that's, that's (laughs) a question I get a lot and (laughs) it's frequent. Uh, I really don't have a clear answer to that. I think it just requires a lot of ambition and some sort of, I don't know, insaneness, craziness to be on your computer nonstop working. I played it. Uh, It's a lot of factors, yeah. (laughs) It's a lot of factors, but I don't know, man. I just enjoy what I do. I feel blessed to have the, the opportunity to just be able to sit on my computer and make video games and actually make a living out of that. So I've like back from Puerto Rico, I started developing this insane work ethic where I pretty much just work nonstop and very efficiently. And since the past year, it's just been getting a lot, a lot, just uh, pretty much. I don't have a social life. I do have a girlfriend (laughs) and I have a family (laughs) back in Puerto Rico. So apart from my girlfriend, I really don't have any people to talk with because I'm always focused on my work. And it's, I don't like wasting time. I like focusing my time and investing all my time into something that's gonna, for, that's gonna blossom in a couple of years. And I'm, I just love what I do. But before getting my job, I was very straightforward with my, with my project. And we even talked about the whole partnership thing while doing the whole hiring process. So 
I'm glad to have to be working with them, with like, Secret Studios, uh, with they're, they're a bunch of friends, uh, and yeah, c just comparing it to my old job where I kind of got fucked over by a contract and lost two of my games. So I've been very, very, very like paying attention to that that whole dynamic to not get fucked over again. But I'm, I don't know, man. I just feel blessed to have this opportunity to, to be able to work on a cool game and have my own project at the same time and also be financially, like, good. So I don't have any worries, and I just can focus all my time into game development. And I just love it. I don't know, man. I can be on my computer for 16 hours. I Well, I, I'm just going to go, like, recap this week. So pretty much I've been waking up at 5, 6 a.m., so I work eight straight hours nonstop. And then I take a small break. And then I jump into my MMO game and I pull like eight or 10 hours and probably around midnight or close to midnight, I go to sleep and I repeat the same process. And that's literally the same thing nonstop for like an entire month, at least recently. And uh, it's, it's, it's tiring, but since I enjoy it so much, it, it, I look forward to waking up and working. It's kind of weird. But yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, you, you have to enjoy what you do to actually balance and just invest all that time into it. Do you, do you think that's healthy? Well, I'm actually pretty healthy. Uh, I work out. I eat very, I, my, like my diet's pretty clean. I eat that organ healthy diet of grass fed beef and like veggies and kale. <laughs> <laughs> I actually do love kale and kale chips, but I mean, it's healthy. At least I'm, I'm, I feel healthy. Like I don't feel like everything, anything's wrong with me. Although I do have some sort of weird guilt for like, like my mind a little bit goes, uh, starts thinking like, why are you wasting so much time on this? But I feel good. I don't have any health problems. And well, I mean, I mean, on the mental health side too. I mean, I would if if you are are out and you're exercising and, you, and you're you're active, that's good. But mm -hmm. you know, it, it's the mental part that that I'm actually more concerned about because it it, it can wear on you. I mean, because I know because I've been it, I've been there, I've done yeah. what you're doing, and it definitely wore on me. And so it's yeah. it's more along those lines of do you think it's healthy in in that sense? Yeah, well, obviously not, but I'm fully aware of what I'm getting myself into. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like putting my hand in fire and leaving it there, even though you know it's going to burn. Right. So I know I know it's going to cause some sort of repercussions in the future, at least on, on the social aspects, like isolation and lack of like relationships. But I'm, I'm fully aware of all that, and I rather – like the pros and cons – at the moment, like the, the pros outweigh the cons when it comes to working and like investing all that time. I know I'm doing it right now because I don't want to do this in the future. I don't want to be 40, 50 and still crunching six, 16 hours a day or something like that. So I, I want to make sure I use my youth, like all this energy that I have, ambition, just push it forward, create some nice systems that are going to like allow me to step back up further in the future kind of like turn into a managing role instead of just being the hustler and the code monkey. But I'm completely fully aware of that. I hear you about the crunch, man. I, when I streamed full time, it was like 10 to 14, maybe sometimes 16 hours a day of streaming seven days a week. Plus all the Ouch. social media and backend stuff, which was like another couple hours, at least a day. And that just burnt me out and killed me after a couple of years. Of that. Now yeah. I like I get up around six ish and then I generally stop around four or five. <laughs> so I do I probably do 10 to 12 hours a day, probably. And then I, I just take the weekends off for the most part. For, for the most part. Yeah, right now I've, I try to take some breaks, but it's 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 weird, man. Like it's uh, it's the complete opposite of like a regular person. Like people want to take breaks from work. Because they want to alleviate and like just release all that stress. But on the contrary, if I don't work, I get stressful and I get depression. Right. Because I'm not working towards something. And just right. It, and I even talked to my girlfriend about this. And I fight with myself 
to take breaks because my mind just starts racing nonstop the moment I stop working. Well, you'll get, and... you'll probably get burned <laughs> out and then all that. So you'll be like, thank God for the silence. Cause that's, that's what it was <laughs> for me. I just got burned out and everything kind of exploded. And how long, how much do you work it? Uh, see the difference between me and Jay and I is Jay takes his laptop top into the living room to work. I'm like, when I walk out of here, I'm like, I will get on my phone sometimes, but I'm done. Jay's like, yeah, but it's 10 o'clock. I'm on my laptop. It's 10 o'clock here, Jay. That means it's midnight there. <laughs> but I don't take the, I don't take the laptop to do Powell group consulting work. It's if more chatting. When, when I've got the laptop and, you know, and I'm sitting in the living room, I'm doing stuff for the indie game business side, or I'm just chatting with people one way or another. It's right. like the, the, in our last house, my office was in a room straight off of the living room. And so it was like you never left the office because it was literally four steps away. Yeah. Now my office is in the, in the, what just technically a garage, but we finished it out and it's, it's a big old room now, but you can't get to my office from the house. You have to go out the door, up the stairs, in the you know, in the door of our house. So you get a little bit of of separation there. So I can I can have that moment where I turn off the lights in here, close the door and I leave and I'm leaving you know, put the little close sign up. Yeah. I'm leaving work behind. And then, you know, I'll go upstairs and you know our son goes to bed at like eight o'clock and I'm not going to bed at eight o'clock, you know, so I'm, you know, up right. doing stuff for this or, or doing, you know, playing a game or whatever, but I've got my, my laptop open up there, but it's not really, it's not work work. It's, you know, it's fun work. IG, it's work fun. IG my my office is like right across the hall from my bedroom. So the first thing I do when I get up is I just get up and walk across the hall and sit down and start doing stuff. I don't even like brush my teeth. <laughs> Brush my hair. It's not. I would be nice to have an office out there. Yeah. Just walk. Like, Brush just my beard. Out of bed at six. I was like, <laughs> just realizing, oh crap, I didn't put a comb through my beard today. Oh no. Well, at least we haven't had one of those shows where you're like, I forgot to put a shirt on, you know? So <laughs> I was wearing this shirt for four days in a row. No, I did put on a new shirt. <laughs> So uh, we were talking as we wrapped up the last show, we were talking about how you find good contractors. How do you, you know, make sure that they're not horrible. And, and you were talking about the culture versus the, the work ethic or, or, or the, the technical fit and how you would rather have someone who was a good fit for the team than have someone who, you know, excelled in everything, but was basically toxic to the team environment. Um, and that's always a curious, because I've, I've I've gone both ways on that, and I think it it really depends on the company and the size of the company and the studio and the composition. Like it's easier to have someone. Well, I'm not even going to say that because I was going to say it's easier to have someone toxic if they're remote, but people tend to be more toxic when they're remote if they're already toxic. So it, it's interesting because I mean I, I have seen absolute both sides of it because I've seen people who were hired at companies because they were a culture fit, but they were completely inept or, or over their head and they weren't able to do, you know, what needed to be done for the company. And then I have seen those people that, that come in and, you know, they're fantastic at what they do, but nobody likes working with them. Yeah. It's, it's way too complete opposites. And I think that the situation is a lot different depending on, like you mentioned, the team size and all that. I really don't have that much experience when it comes to hiring people and all this. I just started getting into this a couple of months ago and just kind of learning as I go through the process. But yeah, I, for now, I haven't hired someone outside of like a freelancing website because I don't want to deal with the whole like time tracking and like all the whole reliability process. So I've been just sticking with Upwork and other websites like Fiverr, but I just, I kind of find that the people 
it just kind of depends. There's a lot of factors. Uh, the country they're from influences a lot in their personality, like how they work. I find that people from, like from India, from the Middle East, they just want to get the work done like as soon as possible. Like they throw the offer and they're like, just let's get to work now. What what needs to be done? And for for other countries, it's kind of like a different. I don't know, man. It's it's weird. Like you got to learn how to deal with people. But I mean, I mean, it's something very generic that <laughs> it applies to any industry or anything like that. But my experience with them so far has been pretty good. I had one bad experience with a guy from India who was building my website, but that's about it. So I right, look. Let's switch gears for for a second there. For a second, and, you know, one of the big parts that you talk about in, in your presentation is mm -hmm. making your even as an indie studio, making yourself look more professional. One of the things that I noticed as we were, you know, as as I was doing the directories for our latest event, is some indies don't have a LinkedIn page. And from the business side of it, you know, I look, that's, that's one of the first places I look to find out about a company. So my recommendation is, you know, make sure you have a LinkedIn page, but what are some of the other like simple things that you've done that you've seen other studios do, but can give you more of a professional, well put together look that you don't see them doing very often? It's mainly creating visibility and creating high quality content. Uh, a lot of, like you mentioned, a lot of indies don't fully use social media, especially LinkedIn, which is the top tier when it comes to this whole, like, obviously work stuff. <clears throat> but yeah, they need to be creating more visibility when it comes to their. A company and B product or game, which is something I really don't see a lot of people. And recently I've I did a little bit of consulting for a game that's kind of like a like an alpha still that's about to jump into beta. It's like a close steam build. So I kinda jumped, I got like hired and upward to do some consulting for this team. And they do have a solid team. They have money. The, the game looks rather all right, but when I started looking on like on Google, I just put the, the company the company name on Google. I first go for the company, look at the company, see their team members. I see if they have LinkedIn pages, and then I jump to the game and just look at what other people are saying about the game. And I didn't see much from the game. And it kind of just, it, it was kind of weird because they had, they have a lot of money. They have good developers. The, the game is shaping up to be pretty good, but they don't have any visibility. There's nothing, there's barely anything about the game with the company. So I don't know how these people expect to sell the game when there's no visibility. And that's kind of like the biggest thing that indies need to do when starting out. It's just creating some visibility, even if you're starting out. If you're nobody, it really doesn't care. You just got to get out there and start making noise, get, start making people notice you. And if you do this very strategically, like structuring your content, knowing what to say, all that, the, the perception that you create on other people about you, uh, it can pretty much be the tipping point in a lot of things, especially when it comes to investors, when it comes to selling games and things like that. So yeah, man, just LinkedIn, create constant high quality content using leveraging all the social media that you can possibly do, get involved in other communities and just create a lot of noise, a lot of visibility because that's what sells the game. You can have the best game, the best team, the best company, whatever, but if nobody knows about you, it's not gonna go anywhere. 
And that, that ties into what we saw with when we talked to Justin French and uh, Hannah Flynn over at Fail Better had a post yesterday on, on Twitter, and she's like, "What is the thing that you know needs to be done most to help market your game?" And you know, I said, "Build a community," and you need that sort of high quality work in order to build that community because what gets people interested it's the screenshots it's the you know the videos mm -hmm. the something that makes it look compelling um and, and even when we pitch projects now to publishers a lot of what we you know what, what i want from my client is a quick video show me why this game is cool in, in less than five minutes because that's always like the first wave of what people are going to look at you know even if you're pitching that project and you don't necessarily send a publisher that video link they're going to search for it because that's a a quick way of going through there and so i mean i agree wholeheartedly you've got to have that high quality content learn to make that high quality content and then actually you know do it along the way as well um, just and then it leads the the game to just be like the the foundation of all that because and I, I think we talked about this last stream about some Kickstarter games, all that, that they created massive content, like high quality content, but then the games just turn out to be scams and asset flips. So the game has to be good. There has to be a solid product for all that to work correctly. Sorry, I'm just, I'm I'm playing around trying to figure out what you know what's going on with with Facebook here. We're still trying to figure out all this caster type stuff uh, <laughs> all right so you've done a lot of this basically organically you know figuring out as you go along you had experience you know with your studio over in puerto rico before you you, you moved all the way across the country when it's time for you to learn something new or approach something that you don't know very well and you aren't as equipped to handle where do you go to learn those skills? Oh, man. I've been, ever since I got into game development, it's just been a constant learning process, just nonstop learning. But I think my learning system, to say, has changed in the last year or so. Uh, back then, a couple of years ago, I used to read a lot of books. And I still have a bunch of books on my backlog, which still need some reading, but I, I used to be a lot in, like involved in the learning process. I used to, when I woke up, I read a bit. And when I was going to sleep, I read a little bit as well. And I was always engaged in this learning process, but eventually I've kind of like understood myself a little bit better. And I kind of figured out how I learn more efficiently. And I found out that I learned a lot better through osmosis, through going through the motion and doing things. And I kind of switched my whole learning process. So I, I kind of stopped reading books for now. And I kind of switched my learning. And like, instead of being theoretical, like just grabbing a book and setting time aside to learn, I learn while I work. And that's ha that has improved my learning process and also obviously the, the work output. Uh, an example, uh, I really, for the past year, I've wanted to get a lot better in my C++ programming skills or programming in general. Like, I want to get into the whole computer science, gritty nitty, like, academical stuff because I never went to college specifically. I think we might have lost them. Oh, everyone crashed. Holy crap. I found out that there we go. I that I all that knowledge kind of doesn't really do anything if you're not applying it. So I was reading books nonstop, but then after a couple of weeks, I kind of forgot all of that. Obviously, because I didn't put the like the time to properly like read all that, digest it, and review the what I learned the day previously, and kind of just create that whole system. But that takes time, and I'd rather invest my time in an active learning process. So if I'm working on my game, if I'm doing some code, 
uh, I kind of step back, st- uh, take a step back and think, so if there's anything I could do right now to improve this code or to like learn something while I'm doing this system. And I can apply that and that's kind of how I learn nowadays. So if I'm gonna, uh, let me see. Oh, okay, recently the level design stuff for my game. So I kind of got back into level design because we needed levels for the game, obviously. And I'm a programmer, so I kind of had to jump back into level design after not touching it for like a year or two. And in the process, I learned a lot of techniques that I didn't have previously. And these were techniques that I could just pull up a YouTube video and like learn that technique. But then it, since I didn't have something to apply it to, that knowledge was going to be lost. But then when I started doing the level design, I learned the techniques and instantly applied it and kept that same process of learning, applying, learning, applying. And when you apply it into something real, like a project or something like that, uh, I found out that the the knowledge kind of sticks and I don't, like, I don't forget about it. And that kind of goes into the whole learning process. We all have all humans, I think there's seven, um, or I'm not sure the number, but every human has a different learning system. More, Some people are more spatial, others are more visual, uh, audio, all that. So when it comes to learning new things, I kind of just stop setting my time for it, and I just integrate it into my work. And it's been very efficient. Like I'm, I'm wasting less time to learn something that I'm not going to use. So I'm, I'm learning more. I'm, I'm applying that knowledge, and I'm in like embedding it into my system, so I never forget about it. And yeah, that's pretty much how I've gone over my knowledge. I always love learning new things, and I think it's just a process that every human should should go through the whole entire life. I mean, you should be learning something new almost every single day. Just keep that process going. So I've had two conversations in the last week with uh, one with with a developer, one with a, a publisher as well. And we were talking about very much what we're doing, the, the, you know, the series of talks with you about, you know, the things that indie developers in particular need to know, but they don't talk about and, and that talking about it is, is what keyed on something you know if you sit down and ask me you know what are the best episodes of the show that you have you know i would point to you know this series with you um lauren carter who was on from uh Noratio, and there's another one that's slipping my mind right now but i'll figure it out shortly and the reason is, you know, because these people were willing to step outside of the comfort zone and talk about things that we don't talk about. And the suggestion came up, you know, should we, you know, do something on, on the indie game business side with our Discord server or, or somewhere else where we we put together panels, but less of a panel, but more of a a group discussion, you know, and, and talk about these things like, you know, being nervous when you're doing your first, when you're, when you're show when you're at your first conference and, you know, you're, you're ready to, to show and people are walking by and how do you feel? And, you know, how do you manage, you know, hiring new people and making sure that they're not, you know, utterly toxic. And another example was, you know, a company whose senior producer up and left, in the middle of a project with absolutely no notice. How do you manage that whole, you know, the emotional side of it, you know, in terms of this is somebody you've been working closely with and they just frankly bailed on you. And how do you manage the, you know, the, the development, the production side of it of, okay, now we've got to pick something up and, and somebody has to pick up the slack and we got to find a new producer and we can't let anything fall through the cracks while we're doing this. You know, from your opinion, you know, would something like that be interesting 
you know, for, and, and anyone out there listening to, always feel free to, you know, send us a message here on, on Mixer or YouTube or Facebook or just email me. You know, my email address is jay at powellgroup.com. We're always looking to, you know, find new ways to improve the communication in this industry. And something along the lines of these, these group meetings could very well be helpful. I mean, have you ever, what do you think? I mean, is that something that would provide a benefit or, you know, is it, am I crazy or? (laughs) No, man, completely agreed. I've, since I started learning all this, like back in Puerto Rico, I have always had the knack to teach people things. I wanted to be a professor when I started doing the whole game development stuff because I love sharing my knowledge and empowering others. And I've also started a brand called the ND Dev, which I haven't had the time properly to sit in and develop it, but it's kind of like... A, like I want to do courses and I want to cultivate this environment community inside of the, the game development slash indie space where it's more of a cell development uh, system. Cause, cause you can see this in other industry. Like I follow a lot of uh, YouTubers, like they're my mentors, pretty much uh, Grant Cardone and a bunch of other YouTubers that they kind of get into this whole self-help, self-development, and all that, social dynamics. And I found out that the, the game development side doesn't really have anything like this, at least from my limited knowledge. But there's really, I, I really don't see a movement where like game developers kind of get into the whole self-development and helping each other and kind of like talking about business business things and other areas to improve. And that's what I wanted to do with my brand. I wanted to publish courses, uh, do some private mentoring, consulting, all that, but not specifically on the game development side because there's a lot of that. There's thousands and thousands of tutorials on how to do game development, but there's barely any tutorials or even people talking about like social stuff when it comes to game development like you mentioned uh that situation where the producer loves uh negotiating contracts uh how to present your games like a lot of things that are really covered and uh, these are areas that a lot of game developers especially indies lack and I've had I had to learn the hard way I had to get fucked over and lose two of my games to learn about the legal side uh, I had to commit a lot of mistakes recently with my game, with team members, and the, the whole process of managing the game. To, it's, it's a lot of things, and I think it would be very helpful. Uh, kind of like this weekly podcast where a bunch of developers just come in and do something similar to this uh, with different topics. And it would be very helpful for a lot of indies. And I think we could even start a like a small community based on that. Like developers talking about these topics and helping each other and like self-development stuff. So here's what I did yesterday after I had this conversation with this person. I, we have a section on the Discord. And if you're not on our Discord, please feel free to come join us. The URL is discord.gg forward slash indie game business. But we had a section in there called ask an expert and it was like, here, here's a channel for production questions and here's one for business and marketing and publishing and licensing and IP, but no one ever used it because I think a lot of this, you know, you do have this, I don't want to ask publicly because it may make me look dumb, but it doesn't trust me. You've been doing this 20 years. You've seen all level of dumb. It does, you're, you're not going to, I can give you somebody not a name, but I can assure you there's somebody else who has asked something crazier. But what people don't understand is there's, if you have this question, there are other people that have this question. So we took that, I took that section and basically renamed all of it to discussions. And the funny thing is with no prompting on my side, other than, you know, changing the name just today, 
one of those chats has been extremely active on, you know, questions around production and, th and things like that. And so we've got that aspect of it, but we may, you know, in the coming weeks start to do like a scheduled, you know, voice chat or, or things along those lines, because I think that's the biggest problem is we have in this age all fucking sorts of, com you know, methods of, of, of communication, you know, we can always call somebody, which doesn't really happen that much anymore. Or, you know, we have Discord and Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and emails and, and Instagram and, and all this other stuff. But with that, people are actually talking less. And so I agree. I think a, a big step for, you know, raising the bar for all indie devs is for us just to come together and say, hey, look, you know, this happened and I'm not sure what to do with it now, or we're thinking about doing this and I have no idea how to, you know, wrap my head around it, you know, because I've been doing this 20 years. I still have those days. You know, it's like, I don't know how in the world I'm going to, you know, pull this one off, but, you know, I subscribe to the Richard Branson theory of if someone offers you an excellent opportunity, you say yes. And then you figure out how to do it. You know, that's how <laughs> that's how this show came about. That's how, you know, I ran the first five or six years of our consulting firm. You know, you there's no straight path in, in this industry, whether you're a developer or a publisher or a, a streamer or whatever, you know, so um, it's good that, that you're on the same wavelength and, and it's not just me and I'm, I'm being crazy and thinking about this sort of stuff. Uh, but that's something I, I plan on doing. It's like everything else. When, you, when I have time to do it, we're going to sit down and do something along, along that line. I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people that feel the same way, but since there hasn't been a movement or people actively pushing for it, they haven't gotten out of the, the caves and gotten involved. Because th there's a lot of... Because I just to add to this, uh, I'm in a Discord, well, multiple Discord servers of game development, and something that I notice is that game developers have huge egos, and they lack no, social No, they do skills. not. They don't. <laughs> Extremists. Well, <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about, Christian. <laughs> I do have a big ego as well, but the, the thing is that they, like, there's a bunch of communities, but there's not people actively involved and engaging in them, sharing content, uh, asking people for, like, to show their stuff, asking for help, uh, doing events, all that. And even the, the small amounts of incentives that I see, I don't see the, the rest of the community going forward with that. They're just kind of there to share their work and like get that satisf satisfaction from getting approved of their, of their work. And that's pretty much it. Like they're swinging, I, I don't know, it's, it's kind of weird. I think it has to do a little bit with ego, like not, not asking questions and social skills. So that's that's my theory about it. Well, and, and I think a lot of it too is people get into this industry because they're passionate about games and they don't get into it because they're passionate about business or marketing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we have clients come to us frequently and they have these great games and they're like, but we don't know what to do with it. And I get that, you know, it, it is frustrating for me, especially when they come to me like a week before they're going to launch and tell me that they need a marketing plan. And I'm like, um, sorry, that, <laughs> that's not going to work. But it's a matter of how do we get that opportunity and knowledge out there? And the only way that I've seen to do it is to just kind of repeatedly you know, beat the bushes with it and, you know, sit down in the mornings and, and start these conversations. Because that's one thing I've learned, you know, through having this Discord server, and we've got over 400, you know, people on it now, is you got to kind of poke that conversation to get it going. And then once it gets going, you know, it gets a lot easier and you get some good conversation but out of it. But it's a matter of, finding the right people and finding the right topics to, to poke and, and getting people to be comfortable enough to ask these questions. Completely agreed. 
So what are some of the things that that you see or that, that you feel developers need to talk about, but they don't? When it comes with developers inside of a team or in general? Anything, anything about indie development at all that you think that, you know, it needs to be more of a forefront of discussion or, you know, are there things that you're curious about with with your studio and, and but what do you, I'm, I'm completely fishing for topics here, Christian. Just don't, just play along here with me. What are, <laughs> what are some of those things that you're like, okay, I think people need to be, pay more attention to this. Yeah, so at least from my experience, from like all the communities I've been involved with and developers that I talked with, I don't, I, just people, I, they need to be a little bit more open with their stuff. There's way too much secrecy and competitiveness, even though it's a very competitive industry, obviously. But I don't know, man. People just need to be a little bit more open, show their work, uh, kind of get involved with each other to improve each other as a developer and improve the industry as in general. But I mean, people are there for different reasons. Some, someone, some developers just want to do the work and not talk to anyone else and just stay completely under the shadows. Others like the more entrepreneur aspect and they want to make a change and they want to get out there and they want to do things. So there's a lot of different so like, personalities within this industry and it's kind of hard to kind of get get everyone along but i think the the catalyst is the passion for games because you don't get you really don't get into game development to make money and if you do then or if you've got other reasons that are not like the passion for games then it's going to turn out pretty wrong but yeah, go ahead. I don't. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I don't know anyone who has ever gotten into this industry and said, "I'm doing this because I want to get rich." <laughs> it's like, no, that's that's why you go do front end development for a bank or something along those lines. That's not gonna. It's not gonna help you help you here. Um, and, and I agree. All right. So another one of the things that I would chime into that about being more open is. And I had this yesterday, you know, someone who was like, we'll show you our game after you sign this NDA. And I'm like, <laughs> that's fine. I'll sign one because I see so many NDAs and so many of these projects anyway that I just basically assume in my head that I'm under NDA with everybody because it makes my life a lot easier. Um, but, you know, that's one of the things is you have to realize that a publisher isn't going to sign an NDA before you show them your project. And you, <clears throat> excuse me. And yes, this is a very competitive industry, but it's not a as competitive on the, oh no, you know, you're doing the same kind of game as me. I'm going to steal your idea because we see that anyway. I mean, look at how long it took Fortnite to come out with the respawn van after Apex Legends introduced respawning into, you know, battle royale games. It's one of those things you have to, like you said, you have to be willing to be able to say, this is what we're doing. This is why we think it's cool because it's about the execution in this industry. It's not about the... Oh my God, there she goes. There she goes. Someone's at Jay's. Someone's, someone's attacking something. <laughs> oh man but yeah i completely agree but i also see a lot of of like eagles clashing and that's something i really don't don't enjoy right yeah that's perfect yeah. there we go that's hey how's out. it going michael <laughs> how's it going michael and Ammon? thanks for um hanging out on facebook um, can never truly actively push indie communication when all developers, streamers, publishers are busy with creating their games, content, marketing. Um, the proper scientific method of indie dev. This was from a few minutes ago, so. From Emin, I don't know how to pronounce your last name, I'm sorry. Gardame. And welcome you guys on Facebook. 
All right. The, the Facebook to, to chat the, doesn't come up in our chat client. But I mean, it's it's one of those that when you are, I understand that it, that it's hard when you're creating a game, and and you don't want someone to the, I don't know, steal your idea or, or whatever. But it, the reason that no one signs these NDAs on the publisher level is because, and this goes back to EA 15, 20 years ago, they're like, you have, we, we have no way of knowing if we have a studio working on this or if we've already seen this, so we can't possibly you know, sign an NDA with you the more you share and get feedback, and that's one of the beautiful things about streaming now, is you can get that feedback very early on and iterate on it. You know, we used to spend a ton of money on focus testing for a lot of the casual games that we did back in the day. And we would, it was, it's so funny to me now because we would send these people into a room and we would, we would be sitting somewhere else, even like in a different state or somewhere else in the world. And we would be watching their screen, what they were doing. And then there'll be a camera pointed at their face. So we could see the reaction. If there was frustration, if there was joy, if there was whatever. Now you just go on Twitch or Mixer now or it's whatever. it's called streaming. <laughs> it's like, congratulations. You have the world's biggest focus test, you know, opportunity now. But if you, if you sit in your office and, and you stay hunched over and it's like, we're not going to announce anything until it, it's done. I think you're doing yourself a gigantic disservice now. Because you know, the one that the one game that I look to, you know, primarily when I'm thinking about you know who did early access well, is Unknown Worlds with Subnautica. I mean, they had that thing in early access. Oh, and it was early, early. early. You could yeah. hardly do. I mean, like you could year, do some year stuff and a half before you know it, it was ready to go live. But and to be fair, their early access was freaking awesome. It was, when it but, very, but very first no came out. Reason, there was no reason why someone else couldn't, you know, do that as well. It's not like they had a gigantic technical advantage over anyone else who has game development and a Steam page. Right. You know, when I look at where that, and I love that game, I mean, I, I've played the, the hell out of it, and I finally even beat it. But the you look at where that game started and where it ended up, and it's night and day because they realized the opportunity they had with getting it out there and making it better. And they're a, what I would call a large indie studio, but they're still, I mean, this isn't like you know, Ubisoft or Activision putting this stuff out here. There are indie teams doing this. And so, you know, it's a good example of how do you, how do you get something out there in front of, you know, the fans. But I think, we would be well served in this industry to do the very same thing on the internal communication side, you know, and say, look, I, I have this issue with one of my you know, team members, or we're having trouble doing this on the marketing side. Or, and it's not, I mean, yeah, we focus on business and marketing here, but it's not all about business and marketing. You know, there's a lot of opportunities out there that, you know, need to be addressed oh we have a question from facebook emin says but at what point do you decide to get it out there and make it better what do you think christian hmm. it's well, I mean, honestly it's I, all I, different depending on the game you know what i mean depending yeah. on everything there's a lot of lot of factors it's a lot of different variables when it comes to that but at least on like my way which I've done so far for the past years, I've always loved to get things out there, even when they're very early. I think that's the best time to start building a community uh, when your game is still in development. And that allows your players slash community to see the game grow and kind of like incorporate them into the development process. Uh, it really depends a lot on your budget, your team, your goals, but at least as an indie, like if you're starting out, if you're doing it as a hobby, or if you have a small team, my recommendation would be to just uh, try, obviously don't push out your game when it's filled with boxes, with cubes and triangles and all that. And you're not even, you don't even have a prototype phase. You just have the, the concept, the idea. So don't, don't really push it out when you have the idea. 
because you're just going to come up as another one of those asset flipping games or these games that you usually see from beginners when they're starting out in game development. Uh, they're like, oh, we're going to build this massive MMO. It's going to be like Grand Theft Auto. And it's like an 18-year-old 18 18 guy with no previous experience. And I, I see that a lot. I kind of got into that as well while starting out. But try to have something playable first. Uh, even if it's a very small prototype, when, when you can at least see the like some very basic gameplay loop or the design of the game, like what is it about that's actually visible in a video, even either a like an edited video that it doesn't necessarily have a gameplay shown or an actual like gameplay. It really depends on your situation, but really just get it out there when you have something pretty that you think you can build upon like a community. Because if you stay quiet and you adopt this mentality of, oh, someone's going to steal my game or they're not going to be impressed, uh, it, silence works, but you got to know when to do the silent treatment and when to start pushing content out. So if you're starting out, just get something out there. Just start making some noise, get some visibility on your game, build a community. Once your community starts, like you actually see people coming in and talking about the game, try to get them involved, ask them for feedback, in, uh, implement their feedback into the game. Like there's nothing better for a gamer to see something that they requested to the developer and it actually made itself into the game. It's gonna be a big plus for that person. You got yourself a loyal customer. And it's going to be good as an PR image in general because they see that you're very open to your community and you have a good relationship with your community. And this is something that even AAA developers are kind of getting themselves into nowadays with the whole boom of streamers and content creators and all that, that even AAA developers are ditching traditional media and going with streamers, and they're actually showing the games in very early phases compared to before when it was mainly just videos and like pre-selected content that they want to show. Right now, they, sh they just give streamers uh, alpha content, like alpha builds and all that, and they're taking advantage of this because the, the whole industry right now, the there's big like there's a big war between consumers and developers especially in the triple a so if gamers see a developer that's very open with them and they actually show the development of the game even when it's on its very rough stages yeah you might get one or two or maybe hundreds or thousands of people coming in and say well this game sucks or it looks like shit when it's on alpha or something <laughs> <laughs> and even if you tell them I, like i gave up with this i gave up telling people it's pre-alpha it's gonna change like i'm just gonna leave them up to their thoughts because the, even if you tell them a hundred times they're not going to understand so you're gonna have people come in during your early stages and they're gonna like say shit about your game but just don't pay attention to those people just focus on giving a good image about your game even if it's very early just push it out there just listen to feedback positive negative whatever don't get emotional about it and just keep this process going showing them new content every month or two months depending on how how your content output is like how much shit you can get done in a time period, just structure some developer blogs, some content every two, one or two months, and just keep that very consistent. And it's kind of like the secret sauce for success for a very small indie game. At least on my game, the game is still in pre-alpha, and it's already made around $20,000 or so from people pre-purchasing it, donating, whatever. And I've already built a massive community of thousands of people without any proper marketing, just word of mouth. And awesome. it's very engaged. Yeah, it's something that I wish other developers kind of got themselves more into because I see a lot of people just staying quiet, not showing a lot of the game. And that's just going to kill your game in the long run. I remember there's thousands of thousands of games coming out or even i don't know the correct number but let's just put it like that there's let's just say there's a thousand of games coming out every single day 
how is your game going to create this ability to break through all those games and start creating hype and build a community? Yeah, just, you can't just uh, have a game. You gotta, you yeah. gotta get it out there. All right, all right so we did, um, uh, our Twitch team did a, a tournament with the game Wardens, which they were at the Indie Game Business Conference, right? The developer oh, of the awesome game Wardens. Game. Yeah, and it was super, super, super early. It's a chess type card game. The card things weren't implemented. I mean, there there were two factions basically, and there's there supposed to be a bunch more. The practice mode wasn't even working, but pretty much we did like this little tournament within our team, and we all like gave them a bunch of feedback. Like we gave them a lot of feedback. Like this is broken. We don't like this. We found a lot of bugs. Uh, all kinds of things. Um, so Nightwolf has a question. Should you license or copyright your game idea slash name before you advertise with a prototype demo? All right. So one quick clarification right there. You cannot copyright, trademark, patent a game idea. So that's not even really an option. For in terms of your game itself, I mean, the game name, it's tough to say. It's like, are you 100%, 1,000% sure that that's going to be the final name of your game? If you are, then then yes. Because that costs a lot of money. One, it's not. It depends on how you do it. One of the things, I, I'm actually talking to a copyright lawyer behind the scenes off and on to get them on the show. And so we can talk about this exact thing. Um, Good, because I want to trademark yeah. the, the term indie. For my name. Good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, just realize you can't, you know, a game idea is, is worth nothing. You know, it, it's the execution. So you can't go in and, you know, say, well, we're, we're going to patent the game idea of dropping 100 people onto an island and they have to level themselves up and, and fight each other. You can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, you can go in and you know, reserve and protect the name of your studio and the name of your game. And so, yes, my opinion, you need to, one, as you're doing, you know, you need to make sure that that game name isn't already copyrighted. Um, as Bethesda has taught us, you need to be a little bit careful that it's not even close to something else. Or has because, one of the worst. Yeah, and Bethesda is far more litigious than a lot of companies on this stuff. And I'm, I'm hoping after they got shot down on their scrolls, you know, lawsuit last time that they'll kind of step back from all I of this. I just wonder but, how much money they spent on that. <laughs> I'm sure, I mean, hell, it could have been cheap. I mean, you're talking about, at that level, you're talking about corporate lawyers and teams of lawyers, and, you know, they were going after Microsoft, so it was probably... A, a thought out gamble, well thought through gamble, but right. you need to make sure that the name is, is, can be reserved in the first place. But then, yeah, you need to, you need to copyright it just as, as soon as you can. Mm -hmm. Just to chime in on this, at least on the copyright stuff, uh, you can just send the copyright, at least on the United States, uh, copyright.gov. You can handle the copyright right there online. I forgot the specific amount. I think it's either $25, $50, don't remember the amount, but you pay a fee. And the way you, you copyright your game, I think it's uh, electronic file or something like that. And what you do, obviously you put the, the name and all your details, maybe the company detail, whatever, but the way you copyright it is that you send them 25 pages or images of your source code. And that's kind of how, how I've copyrighted uh, my previous games. I just send them a request and I send them the 25, at least for my Cyberpunk, my MMO game, uh, I sent them 25 pages of the character code, which were just screenshots of the code and the actual text files themselves. And how that works when actually protecting you, um, I don't have a clue and neither have a clue on the trademark stuff, but I suggest you copyright stuff as early as possible if it's a serious project because it's it, you want to make sure you're safe legally even during the early stages you never know when something bad can come in and just boom take your game away or just lock it completely 
And, and you know, we're, we're not saying don't hire a lawyer because there's obviously advantages to have an attorney, you know, do this for you, but there's also the fact of you're paying that attorney to do this mm -hmm. for you. And you'd be surprised how well even going the basic steps towards doing something like, like, you know, getting a copyright for the name of your game or your studio uh, will go because there's a lot of folks that, you know, will be turned off the minute they do a copyright search and they see you're already there. It's kind of like, you know, when, when we're talking about protecting anything else, be it virus protection or whatever, if somebody wants something bad enough, they're going to get it. But, you know, it's like locking the door to your house. You don't necessarily need a, a $10,000 home security system. You're going to prevent most people from breaking into your house if you just lock the door. You know, but the people that want to get in and, and want that name, and especially the ones, if you're talking about a publisher that had much deeper legal pockets than you do, they're going to get it. But go that extra step and, you know, do what you can up front to get some protection there. And then if you need more later on, do it. But if you don't take that first step at all, you're basically just leaving yourself wide open. Mm -hmm. But I guarantee you, if, if you don't and somebody else with deeper pockets comes along even after your game and wants that same name or a similar name. It's like, technically, I believe as long as you started first, you have the right to it, but you're going to lose that battle because they're going to throw enough lawyers at you that you're not going to be able to you know, deal with it. Yeah, I've been through that and I tried like before I was experienced with all this, I used to talk with my, like the person I had an issue, their lawyer. I kind of got emotional and started talking with them, trying to resolve the issue, but lawyers really don't care. They just care who, much, who uh, how much money goes into their pockets. So they're, they will defend their client, even if their client is unethical and it's completely wrong and it's evil, but they, they don't care. So just keep that in mind whenever, like if you're alone, if you are starting out, it might not seem a big deal to get copyrights and think about the legal stuff. But trust me, once you start getting people involved and getting other people's work involved in your game, maybe a business partner, maybe some audio guy that's making music for your game, uh, trust me, it can get pretty bad if you don't have some sort of legal protection establish uh, contracts, copyright, all that, it can turn nasty pretty quickly. And the last thing you want is paying lawyers and handling legal issues while you just want to make your game. So I mean, along those same lines, I, I know a defense lawyer, and, and you see defense lawyers on all these different shows, and it's like they're always like the guys in the suits that are, you know, defending the mafia people and the criminals and all this stuff. And, you know, and I asked him point blank, cause he's a nice guy. I said, how do you, how do you balance the fact that, you know, if you know this person did this and, and you're, you're getting them off the hook for it. And he said, it, it's not whether or not my client actually did whatever they did. It's whether or not the state can prove it. And I'm like, <laughs> there you go. So, you know, the whole time that you were getting emotional with, with their attorney, the attorney didn't mind one bit because he had his timer running and he was billing his client for it anyway. So, yeah. you know, talk, talk all you want. They're going to get paid one way or another. But generally what I've seen in 20 years of this industry is by the time it gets to, a you know, a, the lawyer stage, that relationship is shot to hell and you know it, it's dead anyway you know a lot of a lot of these issues that crop up during development or during the publishing and distribution side or you know anything like that can be prevented with a little bit of upfront preparedness and the fact that you have the basics and the basics are affordable. I mean, it's not like you don't have to spend tens of thousands of dollars, but you need basic things like contractor agreements and, you know, a, a formal uh, what, uh, organization of your company with, with the state or the country or, or, or however you, if you do this stuff up front, it'll save you a ton of, uh, a ton on the back end. 
Um, so Nightwolf says, if a subcontractor copyrights the models, codes, templates, copy paste the code into your project and edit it slightly before you contracted them to make it for you, would they be able to go after you for more money if your game goes well, even though you have a contract? So one, if they're using something, and again, let me pray, let me clear, I am not a lawyer. I think I should be, but I'm not. I just, I've been doing this for a very, very, very long time. So your mileage may vary, and this is not legal advice and however many other disclaimers I need to make. This is an opinion. When you do the, con if, if that contractor is going to use previously created stuff in your game, when you're signing that contract and you're building that contract with them, there needs to be a clause in there that says, and I forget the legal word for it, but we see it, I see it in contracts all the time. It acknowledges that they're going to be using stuff in your game that was created prior to your relationship. And it gives you the right to use it in perpetuity or however long, you know, it gets phrased in there. So, when you do that contract with the, with the contractor, that needs to be acknowledged and it needs to be, you know, put in the contract initially. And if it is, then no, they won't be able to, you know, go after you because that's what they're saying. They're saying, hey, look, I have this stuff that's already been made and we're going to use it, but you have the rights to use it. That's part of this contract. I wanted to add to this quickly. I had a recent issue with a sound composer in my game. Uh, he made a lot of music for the game, but then we had some some issues, and he quit the team. And he actually got a lawyer involved and sent me a letter to remove all of his cut of his music that he created for the game. And the 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 fault that I did on that was that when I hired him, uh, I didn't put that the 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 work for hire clause that the content you do for the game is my property like once you submit it to the game so due to this he was able to just get a lawyer and threaten me and i had to remove all of his music that he did for like months and i think it just one more small thing is that even if you don't copyright something and Again, disclaimer, not legal advice, just opinions. And <laughs> None of us are lawyers. <laughs> yeah. So, but this is what someone told me and like what I've read is that if you create something, even though it's not copyrighted, you still are the author of it and you're legally like, you're the owner of it legally. If obviously, if no one else can prove otherwise. So yeah. I. Mm -hmm. in, in your case, then they created it. Mm -hmm. So they are the author and, and, and they own it, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And because it was not covered in that contract that you did with the music contractor that said, Hey, you're using this and, and it's ours and you know, blah, 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 legal, legal, legal. Mm -hmm. They were able to come in and just say, okay, well now you're not using it. Yeah. Kind of sucks. I, and that's another learning opportunity I had recently, but just to put it on perspective, I've could have just, come back and got a lawyer and just send it a letter mentioning that the, the composer used trade secrets and important information, like all that crap in the process of creating music because he was exposed to trade secrets and like secret information about the game to be able to produce that content. So maybe I could have used that to fight over, but I wasn't in a position to start going all that process. So I just completely removed everything and just complied and I've got myself better music now. But yeah, just you wanna make sure that there's a clause whenever someone's doing something for your game, that if they created that for the game, it's yours once like they send it over and it's your property, not theirs, even though if they created it. Again, just a little work up front protects all of us on the, <laughs> on the back end. And that's, and, and that's why we do this. And, and that's what it is kind of, you know, shitty is because a lot of people don't realize that that's something you need to do. That's something you need to have in there. And you see it a lot in this industry where you have, you know, people that have worked together or friends coming out of college or high school or whatever. And they're like, you know, we're friends and let's create this company. And then when you're not friends, it gets nasty. You know, it, it, I've always said, and I've always been told, and you make 
and create contracts to prepare during the good times to prepare for the worst. You know, it's it's not a situation, you know, when, when you're sitting down with your friends and you're like, look, we're each gonna own a third of this or however you decide to set up the company, you have to realize that that contract isn't for right now while everybody's getting along great and, you know, And it should also be to protect all parties. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I just protect your own ass, but protect everybody. Cause I mean, if you care about the other party, which you should, um, it should also be to protect them as well. Exactly. All right, well, we are running up against our time frame again, but I think now, Christian, we have actually gotten through all the questions that we have. And, and then some more. Yeah, I've been completely aware of the time now. I've tried to control my rambling a little bit because I just start talking and forget about the time. Don't worry about it. We do the very same thing. It's all good. And the dogs bark. You and should then, use you know, Toggle. Shows up and... Toggle is awesome for uh, like seeing how much time you do on things. Isn't that right, Jay? Yes. P-L-G-G-L. I love that thing. Yeah, me too. So, Christian, thank you, as always, man. I mean, we want to continue to hear about how things are going at The Real Job, and we want to continue to get updated on on your game as well, because Indy and I are both very, very interested. Yeah, and I want to play it. playing it. Uh, That's funny. And for everyone else out there, we are now live Wednesdays and Fridays at noon Eastern on at least (laughs) YouTube, Mixer, Facebook, Facebook. And probably more coming soon. We're still, you know, expanding and doing this. Uh, Always just search for Indie Game Business. We are, the podcast is available at anchor.fm slash Indie Game Business. The website is Indie Game dot business. Anything else we need to plug or go over? Is that it, dude? Um, yeah, make sure and follow us on whatever. Um, my, my Twitch is twitch.tv slash indie. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter, twitter.com slash the real indie. And Jay, your Twitters. My personal Twitter is Powell underscore J. Yeah. That's where you're going to find everything from my comments on random shit in the industry to the beer that I'm drinking that day. Um, and the company, the Powell Group, who actually produces this lovely little show, uh, our company Twitter account is Powell GRP. All right. And Christian's is Far Frontier LLC. That's for your game, right? Yes. All right. And we'll put all of this lovely stuff in the, in the notes on the podcast and the episodes and all that stuff as well. Yeah. So oh, thank you guys so much. See y'all next week. See ya. Thank you, Christian. Thank Bye. you, guys. All right.